Today's topic in Archaeological Laboratory is archaeological conservation. Now, I don't propose to teach you how to be a conservator. That's a very long and uh, elaborate process. But every archaeologist who uses a lab or handles artifacts in the field, for that matter, should know some of the basic aspects of archaeological conservation. And today we're going to focus in particular on what you might call the care and handling of artifacts. In other words, how do you handle them, how do you move them from place to place, and how do you store them safely? Now, most archaeologists don't actually do archaeological conservation work. We leave that to expert conservators who have the training in chemistry and other things that you really need to know in order to do conservation properly. But really simple kinds of cleaning and so on are done by archaeologists quite routinely, uh, at least in the case of artifacts that are fairly stable, what a conservator would call type C uh, artifacts. So for example, lithics are somewhat difficult to damage, but you still have to be careful because they can be damaged during the course of cleaning. And most kinds of pottery that are well fired can be cleaned by archaeologists without a great deal of difficulty. Um, the key thing is to do as little as possible to alter the surface of these artifacts. Um, so if we're washing a lithic like this, for example, we would just take a shallow basin of water, we immerse the lithic in the water, and we use an old toothbrush to gently scrub dirt away from the lithic. Uh, and if there are carbonate buildups on the lithic, as sometimes happens, calcium carbonate can be deposited on artifacts while they're buried in the ground, uh, partly as a result of rising and lowering of water tables. Um, quite often we would leave those to, to a later date. You don't try to scrub, scrape them off or anything while you're washing because you could damage the lithic. You could create retouch that doesn't belong there, for example. So you would just wash it gently, rinse it off, and set it aside to dry, being very careful not to uh, displace it from its label. So if it came in a labeled bag, you might rest it on the bag, make sure it's not in a place where it's windy and the bags, bag labels are going to blow away or anything like that. Because again, contextual information is extremely important in archaeology. Same thing goes with pottery. You can just gently try to wash the dirt off. But you don't want to be too vigorous about it because some of the pottery, including this one, has a slip on the surface. And if you're too vigorous, you'll wear the slip off. Uh, I know of one occasion where an overeager student uh, was washing potsherds and was trying to get calcium carbonate off. And I think used the, end, the other end of the toothbrush and went like that and actually burnished the pot. So it the, burnished the potsherd so it looked like it was from a burnished pot when in fact it was not. So you have to be very careful just to be very gentle about it. And unless it's going to be put on display or something, it's not that important to remove all the calcium carbonate anyway. We only have to have is enough removed that we can actually tell what the characteristics of the pottery are. And in the case of lithics, if we might want to remove calcium carbonate that's, that's hiding uh, retouch or something that we need to look at. But you don't have to, in most cases, remove all of it. It's not that important. Now, one other thing I should mention, though, if you're washing artifacts in a basin like this, quite typically, uh, archaeologists wash you know, a, a bunch of artifacts that come from the same context on the same occasion. They might even put them all, immerse them all at the same time. Um, when you're going to do that, and especially if you're going to reuse the basin for another lot of, archae of archaeological objects uh, shortly thereafter, uh, that they come from a different context, you want to make sure you don't accidentally leave something in the water that might then get accidentally introduced into the next bag of artifacts so that its contextual information gets uh, mis- applied or whatever you want to call it. So it's very important not to do that. So one th way to, to mitigate that is to put the artifacts in one at a time so you don't have any risk of mixing things up. If you dump a whole bunch in, you might miss one or two. Um, and the other, if you do want to put in multiple artifacts at the same time, you can put a mesh inside, inside the basin so that you can pull the mesh out each time and, and check it to make sure there's nothing in there uh, so that you don't accidentally leave something in the basin. Now, one of the things that's very important is to label every artifact that you have in your lab, especially once it gets removed from the bag in which it was originally collected. Uh, when people are excavating or doing survey in the field, typically they collect artifacts and put them in uh, some kind of bag that's properly labeled. When it comes back to the lab, we often want to remove artifacts from those bags and send them for cleaning, photography, conservation, whatever the case may be. And it's extremely important that we don't lose the contextual information that's associated with each of those artifacts. So, 
very important thing is to make sure that all your artifacts in your lab are labeled properly so we don't lose their contextual information. So when they do arrive from the field, uh, you want to make sure that each one gets individually labeled so none of them get lost. The way you do that is you first clean off an area of the shirt, in this case a shirt, uh, in an un unobtrusive location. By that I mean you want to pick a location that where you're not going to obscure some detail that you might want to record later on or photograph later on. So for example, usually if there's some kind of decoration on the surface of a pot, you don't want to put the label on top of the decoration because that would obscure it. So you pick an unobtrusive location, so, such as on the interior of a, of a large jar, um, and you make sure it's a clean spot. So if it's not clean, you have to, re in this case, somebody had to remove some of the carbonate encrustations. Uh, but you don't have to remove all of it because it's not really that important as long as enough is exposed that we could record the color of the surface and that sort of thing um, but, and also have an area that's big enough for us to record the label. So once you have that area cleaned off, you would then take a 10% solution of B72 and acetone and use an artist brush. I'm just going to do it in a different spot here. Just paint a small rectangle of the B72 and then you wait for that to dry and that will provide a nice clean smooth surface on which to write uh, and there are a number of ways you can attach a label some people actually even print out labels or even use barcodes or something that would then be adhered to that layer of, uh, of acetate uh, but a very common way to do it is you use a fine point pen that has a permanent black ink uh, unless of course you're writing on black artifacts like obsidian or a dark flint or something like that in which case you might use a white ink, but the important thing, it has to be a permanent ink in a fine point pen or a quill pen that some people like to use. And then you very carefully and legibly write the artifact number on there, which usually is some combination of site number or project number, uh, context number, and then individualized artifact number. And then you let that dry for a while as well, and then you paint on another layer of the P72 acid, uh, acrylic uh, mixture so that it seals the label on there and makes it reasonably permanent while still being reversible because we can, if we made a mistake or something we could always brush on a little bit of acetone which would dissolve the acrylic and allow us to take the label off. Uh, even though it's fairly permanent it is important to monitor your collections periodically because even, even though it's fairly unlikely it's possible under some environmental circumstances uh, that the label could start to curl off the artifacts. So you've got to be careful to watch for that. One thing that's very important is to know how to, how to handle artifacts because you don't want to damage them in the course of moving them from place to place or, in, or during an examination of the artifact. So I've got a couple of examples here, but the f first and foremost I want to mention that the surfaces where you're working should be padded with something. So here you see a sheet a kind of styrofoam that provides padding on the counter because the single most obvious way you're going to damage an artifact is by dropping it. We're all human and we all drop things from time to time and it would be terrible to be holding an artifact over the floor for example and if you drop it on the floor it's going to break for sure and even if you uh, drop it on the countertop, a hard counter countertop, it's only dropping a short distance but it's still fairly likely to break or at least get a chip out of it or something like that. So we don't want that to happen so we always always only handle artifacts over top of a padded surface. But there's also some other things you need to know about how to handle those artifacts. So for example, here's one that's actually been kind of pieced together. And I'm going to demonstrate some things that you should never do. So the fact that I'm doing that doesn't mean that you should do that. When you have an artifact like this that has projecting parts or handles or something like that, even though the handles were designed to be held in antiquity, you do not hold it like that because it's a very good chance the handle's going to break off. Particularly in a case like this where it's already been broken and it's been pieced back together, the uh, adhesive is not likely to hold and you're going to break the thing off and you might cause even more damage than was there originally. So you always should support uh, artifacts below their center of gravity as best you can or from underneath like that to make sure that they have adequate support and that you're not putting undue pressure on any particular part of the artifact. Try to distribute the weight as much as, as possible. And that doesn't go just for things like complete pots, but also for individual shirts. Now, here's a fairly big one, um, but you want to make sure that you're supporting it underneath uh, so that you're not like doing things like that, because that's fairly likely in most cases to cause the shirt to break in half. 
and uh, they're broken enough as it is. We don't want to break them anymore. Lithics and most kinds of pottery are fairly robust, and unless you're going to use them for some kind of archaeometric analysis, like uh, chemical residue analysis on pottery, something like that, it's probably okay to handle them with your bare hands, although it's still better in most cases to wear nitrile gloves when you're analyzing artifacts because some of them can be damaged by the oils and salt that comes from your skin. Um, and also, it's better for you in terms of health and safety because artifacts are quite often dirty and if you touch an artifact and later touch your eye or something like that, you could end up getting some kind of infection or something. So we already talked about that in the health and safety video. But certain kinds of artifacts are particularly vulnerable to being handled with your bare hands, and you don't want to do that. You should always wear nitrile gloves when you're handling those kinds of artifacts. And what I'm mainly talking about are metal artifacts, especially when they're made of iron. Uh, when, you, with you, when you handle them with your bare hands, and even if you handle them with cotton gloves, you can get oils and salts from your skin adhering to the metal and becoming sites of corrosion. And that's what you don't want to have happen. So for example, um, this metal artifact, I'm not actually exactly sure what it is, it comes from a uh, historic site. Uh, when we're analyzing that, we should be handling it with nitrile, nitrile gloves so that we don't get any oils, grease, dirt, or salt on its surface. Um, this is particularly impor important in the case of coins. Um, here we have an example of a medieval coin from India. Uh, partly because already from being buried in the ground they're quite often kind of corroded and to identify them we need to be able to read the relief that's on the coin, uh, see what kind of design is on the coin and read it and that can be hard enough at the best of times but if you handle it with your bare hands and cause extra sites of corrosion any new corrosion that occurs on there is going to potentially disguise parts of the design and make it that much harder to identify. So when you're holding a coin you should always hold it by its edges not by the flat parts that have the design on them, uh, and you should wear gloves, ideally. But if you can't wear gloves for whatever reason, at least hold them by the edges, so that if there is any site of corrosion, it's on the edge where it's going to be less concerning than if it were on the flat obverse or reverse side of the, of the coin. Archaeologists don't normally do a lot of archaeological conservation work beyond simply washing the more robust kinds of artifacts like lithics and uh, and well-fired pottery. However, one of the other exceptions is reconstructing pots and refitting lithics together uh, when we have reason to believe that we have potential for a lot of refits among a collection of sherds or flakes. Today I'm going to demonstrate a little bit about how that's done in the case of pottery. So when we have a context where we're lucky enough to have a bunch of sherds that look like they might come from the same vessel, uh, it's very tempting to try to figure out how to put the pot back together again. Now, for those of you who enjoy jigsaw puzzles, this might be just the kind of work for you. Uh, however, there's a few things you have to keep in mind when you're doing it. It's often tempting, as soon as you find a, a, a fit, you find two shirts that can fit together, you want to glue them together immediately. I would highly discourage you from doing that. It's much better instead to start out by laying out all the shirts on a table, uh, sorting them a bit to find shirts that appear to be similar in their color and fabric and type of vessel so that they potentially could come from the same vessel and even then you have to be a little bit careful about color because uh, pot, pots can vary in their color from one part of the vessel to another so that can sometimes be a bit misleading so fabric and pottery type are probably more likely to be of value and once you have a, a pile of shirts that you think are probably from the same vessel then you can try to start finding finding fits between them when you do find some sherds that look like they fit together, uh, rather than fitting them together immediately, you're better off to label them uh, near the joints. And you should use fairly loose tape or sticky labels uh, that you don't leave on very long. You don't want to leave them along, on long enough that they actually kind of get stuck on there semi-permanently. But just to indicate where those joints are, which sherds you think fit together. And set them aside and keep doing this until you find quite a few joints. Because ideally, when you're going to, if you're going to physically fit together the shirts to make a reconstructable pot, you want to do that on a single sitting and get, do it all at once. Because otherwise, what tends to happen, let's, let's look at this one for a second. 
So this is an example of what I just told you not to do. Somebody has fit together uh, several shirts to make part of the circumference of a, of a pot rim, but um, hasn't completed the circle. What can happen if you do this kind of piecemeal is that every time you join two shirts together, there's a little bit of potential error in how you, how you fit them. And if you don't get it quite right, um, and then you try to fit, let's say we, let's say this, for example, uh, also belongs to the same pot, and you decide later on to fit it on there. In fact, I think it actually does. Uh, maybe not. Well, actually, it does. Yeah, it go, fits here. It fits over here. When you do that, sometimes it happens that the when you try to close the circle, it doesn't fit properly. It might kind of overlap like this or like this. So you you can't physically join together the shirts at the far end of the circle. And then you have to break some of the joints. Actually, you don't, don't exactly break them. You use a little bit of acetone to dissolve, to dissolve the adhesive that's there, and then uh, redo the joints to get them to fit properly, which is a kind of a nuisance thing to have to do. So it makes much better sense to fit them all together at, in pretty much the same sitting, or at least make sure you, you do the entire circumference in one sitting so that you don't have that kind of problem. Now, when you are refitting pottery, uh, normally you'll do it in something you might loosely call a sandbox. And you see an example of that here. You'll notice, however, that what's in here is not sand. Uh, although you could use sand, the reason I don't recommend using sand is sand gets stuck to the glue that you've used to, to fit the pieces together. And that's a real nuisance because then you have to remove the sand afterwards, which can be quite time consuming if you want to do it carefully and you don't want to damage the slip on your pot and that kind of thing. So what I recommend you use instead are things like these. These are beans. Um, you can use bean, uh, some kind of beans or peas or something like that. Uh, some people use rice, uh, although rice can get stick, stuck to the joints pretty easily also. These, you know, it's not that they won't get stuck to the joints, but fewer of them will, and they're really easy to take off. You just brush it a bit with your finger and they pop right, pop right off. So it's much less likely to give you some, some kind of nuisance gunk attached to your joints uh, later on if you use uh, these beans. Now the purpose of doing the refitting in a, in a basin that's full of uh, beans like this is that it allows you to position the sherds while you're working on it so that they get some support and don't fall apart halfway through your gluing process. Uh, the other thing you can do is make little bean bags to support some parts of the pot while you're doing it. So it's a good idea to have a bunch of these little bean bags available and you can kind of stuff them here and there to make sure that the, the shirts don't fall over while you're trying to, to fit them together. In addition to putting those little sticky labels on the edges of shirts to show which shirts they match up with uh, to keep track of that process, one of the other things you can do is you can make a diagram while you go that shows how they, shows how they fit together and kind of reminds you of where they go when you start the physical process of fitting the pot together. When you find two pieces of pottery that you think fit together, you kind of test it by placing them together like this, and kind of gently rocking them a bit to see if they fit. And here you can see it's actually a pretty good fit. So we know that we can label those two pieces, and if these are actually, I see I cheated, I picked ones that had already uh, been labeled, so I knew that these fit together. So the little, the little temporary la labels uh, help us, help remind us which shirts go with what, so we also can somebody's label that show which shirt goes over here and which one goes up here and that'll save a lot of time later on when you, when you do the actual physical fitting them together. Now when we're using the adhesive to fit the shirts together that we've already decided should fit together, um, we use uh, in this case 10% B72 in acetone. This is an acrylic adhesive. It's quite commonly used in archaeology because it is a reversible adhesive, so if we ever make a mistake, it's very easy to, re to remove the adhesive from the shirt. Um, and what we do, you know, keep in mind, uh, anytime you're using chemicals, you need to be very aware of the health and safety issues surrounding those, and that's why we're doing this in a, f in a fume hood, so that any vapors from the acetone in the, in the adhesive will go up the fume hood and won't be uh, dangerous to anyone. Now. Um, B72 has already been mixed up. We do this by dissolving a granular uh, acrylic in the acetone at the right ratio, in this case 10%. So 10% B72 and 90% acetone. And uh, we take our shirts 
and we use just an artist paintbrush and we gently kind of paint the edges of the shirt with the adhesive. I should say the 10% that I'm using here is actually the is a sealant kind of to kind of prepare the edge for the use of the stronger adhesive because for the adhesive we actually use 30% B72. Okay, so that makes it so that they're ready. You can see, yes, again, confirm that they do fit together. Notice the jars we use are properly labeled. And then we would take the stronger um, adhesive or the stronger batch of B72 that we do use as an adhesive. I'm not going to do it here because I'm not really ready to put these two shirts together. But then we would just paint the, the thicker uh, solution of B72 and acetone on the edge. And then gently, gently fit these together, rock them a bit to make sure that they're a good fit. And then hold them together with your hands for at least 30 seconds or so. And then we would take them to the, to the bin of the beans to prop these in and uh, let them dry for uh, a short while. So when we've adhered several shirts together, we can place it in the, bean, the beans like this and kind of gently rock it a bit, maybe pile some little bit of beans around it to help support it while, while the glue is drying. Uh, and we can also take little bean bags like this and prop the shirt so it doesn't fall over while it's, while it's drying. Um, but as I said, we would want to continue this process to get an entire circumference around this pot. So before, while this gets a little bit dry, but it isn't completely dry, we'd want to add on the next bunch of shirts. And possibly we'd then be uh, moving this gently to a position perhaps like this with some extra shirts uh, attached over, over here. And continue the process, again, supporting it uh, with little bean bags. Now, as we continue that process, the pot starts to, starts to form. We piece more pieces together. And here are some others that I think fit here somewhere. I think, I think this one fits here. So we would add, add some adhesive here and some adhesive here and gently fit them together. I actually haven't put adhesive this time because I'm just trying to demonstrate this for you. But you can see how we want to want as quickly as possible to get the full circumference of the of the pot uh, placed here. So we do it. You know, not immediately, not all at once, but on the same day while the joints are still a bit soft, so they're still a little bit flexible. In addition, if you're in too much of a hurry to glue shirts together, you may create areas like this where you kind of lock out a future addition of a shirt so that it will no longer fit. Now, some archaeologists are tempted once they fit two shirts together with some adhesive and get a nice fit on there. Uh, in addition to putting in the, in the beans here, they also are tempted to put some masking tape along the join to help hold it together. I don't recommend doing that, at least not unless it's a very temporary placement of the masking tape, because if you leave it on there for too long, as someone has done in this particular instance, you'll notice there's some discoloration here, some rectangular discol discoloration that results from a chemical reaction between the glue that's in the tape and the minerals that are in the slip on the pottery. And uh, that might be impossible to correct. Now, on the one hand, it's maybe it's an aesthetic thing that doesn't really matter too much, as long as when we describe the pottery, we take our color measurements, for example, from some part of the shirt where, where that has not happened. But it's something really we shouldn't be doing. Uh, one of the important tenets of cons conservation is that you should, it's kind of like do no harm. You shouldn't be doing anything to the shirt that's not reversible, that you can't remove. And it's not clear that this would be easy to remove because it's not probably not just an, a matter of some adhesive that's stuck on the surface of the shirt. There's actually been a chemical reaction there, most likely, uh, that might be impossible to reverse. One last thing I should mention about the use of these basins full of beans in order to reconstruct pottery and other kinds of things is that there is some risk that the beans or rice or whatever you put in these bins could attract pests like mice. That's one disadvantage of these, these things over using sand. Uh, but there's this very simple solution. All you have to do is make sure when you put these away in storage afterwards that you make sure they're sealed with a plastic lid. It makes a pretty good seal. 
When it comes to storing artifacts safely in an archaeological laboratory, it's really handy to have high quality metal cabinets with closing doors because they kind of maintain a stable environment inside the cabinet. They don't, the, the, the metal doesn't give off any fumes or anything like that that could damage artifacts. Whereas wood shelving, for example, especially if it's made of something like plywood or particle board, can, has a lot of glues in it that can give off vapors over the years uh, that wouldn't necessarily hurt, hurt all artifacts. Things like lithics would probably be fine, but some kind of artifacts would have uh, uh, deleterious impacts from those fumes, especially if they're acidic. Um, so these kinds of cabinets are really good to have. Of course, they are rather expensive. And it's really nice that they're lockable, they're closable. That means they're also protect, protecting your artifacts from fire. If there's ever a fire in your lab. Of course, if there's a fire, the sprinkler system will come on, and then you'll have all your artifacts drenched with water, unless they're in a cabinet like this. When we open the door, it, these things typically have a large number of shallow drawers so that we can spread artifacts uh, within them. It's quite handy, actually, to divide the drawers into rows. You can put little dividers in divide them in the rows and then here we have them organized by artifact bags so these are all each bag contains artifacts found in the same context but sometimes you will have drawers that have individual artifacts uh, distributed throughout throughout them but not necessarily in bags and uh, one of the things I should mention about these drawers though is that first of all uh, the drawer itself is heavy duty and a little bit heavy and once it's loaded with artifacts it's very heavy so as I mentioned in the health and safety video you really need to be careful about how you remove and replace drawers like this so that you don't injure your back. Um, but some other things I need to tell you that have to do with the conservation aspect is that especially when you, your artifacts are loosely arranged in the drawers, every time you either push a drawer in or pull it out, it shifts everything slightly. The artifacts move around because they, they gain a little momentum as you're, as you're moving the drawer. And that causes friction on the artifacts. It causes artifacts to bang together, potentially. So you could get some damage to the artifacts while they're in the drawer. Pretty minor damage, but if you're doing things like use wear analysis, uh, careful attention to retouch on lithics and that sort of thing, you could create some damage in the drawer that looks very similar to the kind of damage you're looking for from some prehistoric site or whatever. So you need to be a little bit careful about that. Now, some of the things you can do to mitigate that is to line the bottoms of the drawers with a thin layer of foam. That will reduce the amount of shifting around that occurs. And for particularly sensitive artifacts, one of the things you can do uh, is to use a thicker layer of foam and cut little receptacles in it that are approximately the same shape as the artifact. So the artifact rests in that, in that little hollow, and then it doesn't move around very much when you move the drawer, open and close the drawer. Uh, and it also prevents it from banging into other artifacts that are in the drawer. Usually that's a, a solution that we wouldn't be likely to use except for the most sensitive kind of artifacts and when there aren't a huge number of artifacts. You know, as you can see here, there are thousands of artifacts in this cabinet alone and it would be, we would require quite a few cabinets to accommodate them if they each got their own individual little hollow uh, in the drawers. Uh, another thing that's very important, of course, is not only do the artifacts in these drawers have to be properly labeled so that we know, that, so that we know their archaeological context, if they're in bags, the bags should also be labeled. The fronts of the drawers should also be labeled. And the front of the cabinet should also be labeled. It makes it easy to find things and to make sure that we don't ever lose the contextual information for the artifacts. Another type of storage that's quite handy to have in an archaeological laboratory is this. These are actually baker's carts used in bakeries and restaurants and so on. Um, they generally have aluminum frames. They're on wheels, so you can move them around, which is kind of handy. Um, and instead of having fixed shelving, they consist of a bunch of aluminum trays, like restaurant trays or baker's trays. And you can place sherds on there and slide them out and put them on a work surface if you want to do some work on them, and then put them away up here afterwards. I find these are a very good solution, not so much for permanent storage of archaeological objects, but for temporary storage. For example, when you're, you have a very busy laboratory with lots of people working on stuff, but they're not there all the time, uh, you don't want them kind of hogging the counter space by having a bunch of artifacts laid out and then nobody else can use that space for perhaps weeks on end. Instead, people can work on these trays, and when, they're, when they have to leave for the day, they can pick up their tray, put it on the cart, and 
then that frees up the space for other people to use. So these are great solutions, I find, for temporary storage of artifacts uh, and that can be put away in their proper place once that particular job is done. One of the other advantages of these kinds of baker's tray carts is that rather than having to lug the artifacts from storage to the workspace, you can actually wheel the entire cart over there and then remove the trays that you need onto, onto, the, onto the countertop. However, if you only need to use one tray, then it makes sense instead to use our usual lab cart and just remove the tray that you need by sliding it out and then gently putting it on the cart and then we can wheel it over to the work, work area. As I've already mentioned several times, it's really important to protect the contextual information for each and every artifact by making sure that it's properly labeled. It's also equally important to make sure that we can keep track of where the artifacts are in our lab. So it makes sense to have the lab well organized with well labeled cabinets and drawers so we can find them in their drawers. Uh, and it's also extremely important to track artifacts that have been removed from those drawers. Uh, ironically, one of the things that tends to happen on archaeological projects is that the artifacts and echo facts and so on that are the most important or the most interesting are quite often the ones whose contextual information goes missing. And that's because somebody pulls it out of a bag to take it for photography or something like that. And if they don't make sure it's labeled first, we can lose track of it. So one of the things you should have, or at least I recommend you should have in your lab, is uh, some kind of logbook or s database or something that keeps track of where artifacts are and, and especially keeps track of artifacts that have been removed from their normal location to be taken somewhere else, whether it's for teaching, photography, illustration, uh, on, loan, on loan to somebody else's lab, whatever the case may be. One possible tool for that that I like to use, I, I call a specimen leave log. And this is simply a binder we keep in the lab uh, where people have to sign out any artifact that they want to take, take for some particular purpose, whether it's photography or whatever. So they have to sign it out and they also have to sign it back in so that we can keep track of which ones have been returned. And if we notice in the log that there's something that's been out for a long time and it has not been returned, we know who to track down to get it back. In addition to having the specimen leave log, however, it's also useful to have what I call a specimen remove tag because when you have to put the, the removed object back where it belongs, it can be kind of time consuming to have to kind of rifle through drawers and figure out the proper place where it goes and then, and then insert it back in its place in the drawer. Whereas if you have these uh, specimen remove tags, you can fill it out for each artifact that gets removed from the drawer and place it right in the drawer where the artifact belongs so that you know where to put it back. And also if anybody comes looking for that artifact and finds it's missing, They'll see the tag there and they'll know why it's missing even before they bother to check the specimen remove log. Now sometimes you want to be able to ship a fairly delicate, irregularly shaped object like this bronze cat, or technically it's a somewhat beat up plaster cast of a bronze cat. Uh, but if we were to pretend that this was a real one, I would be wearing gloves because I wouldn't want to handle a bronze artifact with my bare hands. But uh, assuming it was a real one, in, in, when we ship it, we want to make sure it's not jostling around where it can get chipped up, like you can see this one already is, um, and uh, that it's not going to break during shipment. And one of the best ways to do that with any irregularly shaped artifact is to take a piece of foam and cut out, you know, basically trace out the shape of the object and then cut the foam so that the object fits neatly in that. So we can cut the outline of the artifact in the foam like this to make a hollow space to receive the artifact. You can go in like this, so it's, so it's nice and securely, securely uh, held so that if the box that it's in rattles around, it's not likely to move the thing. So it's perfectly protected. It's not even going to get uh, friction wear on it. So this is something I highly recommend when you're shipping more delicate kinds of objects. Furthermore, if we cut the foam so it fits the box we intend to, to pack the artifact in, we just place the foam in like this so it fits snugly in the box. Then place the artifact 
and it's now very snugly in the box. Now, if we want to do this really, uh, really well, we would then cut. We would also cut another piece of foam that's the mirror image of that one, so it would fit over top of the artifact. In this case, the little cat statuette, so that the 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 artifact is held very securely inside the box and can't possibly rattle around at all. I hope you found my video on basic archaeological conservation helpful. If you did, you might consider clicking on the subscribe button down below, and that way you'll be updated when I publish new videos about basic archaeological methods. You can also find out more about this topic by checking out Chapter 9 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, published by Springer. Have a good day, and stay safe.